seated. Well, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and I am so glad that you are here to worship the Lord together. And uh, God has been good this week, and today we come to celebrate His goodness for the past week and also to prepare for the challenges of the week ahead. And we're glad you have chosen to be in the house of the Lord to worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we just ask the Lord to be merciful to us once again today as we open His Word and as, as we sing His praise. So we're glad you're here. If you're here uh, visiting today, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. We hope you'll take just a moment to fill out the card there in front of you. And uh, our staff prays uh, for... Uh, certain prayer needs and uh, health problems, but also those who are visiting with us, we, we, we remember you every Tuesday morning uh, as we gather. So please do that, and when the offering is received, just drop that uh, in the offering plate this morning. It's especially good to have Brother Tom and his wife, Miss James, uh, Janie, with us today. Uh, Brother Tom has just recently retired as pastor at the uh, Poplar Grove. I always get all these churches' names together, but has just recently re retired, so pray for them. And I told him that if uh, when it, the last song is sung and it's time for the preaching, if he accidentally stands up, we'll understand that, uh, just out of habit. But, uh, but pray for their family in this time of, of adjustments for them and decisions that they're making, but it's good to have uh, them in our service today. And, uh, but God bless you. I uh, tell you, the Lord is good. Pray for one another. We, we've got a lot of our folks uh, squeezing in those final days of summer vacation. And uh, pray for the safety of uh, different ones uh, in the church, uh, that God will bring us all home safely and uh, get back to a little bit of normal uh, in our community. Well, as far as some announcements, let me just share with you a few things here and a couple of prayer matters. Uh, the associational meeting will be held uh, tomorrow night at Richland Baptist Church. And Tuesday, we will be hosting uh, the meeting. The meeting will start at 4.30. Tuesday, we'll be providing a, a meal. And as you note in the bulletin there, we've asked the Mark Best class to provide salads. Uh, the Ruth and Naomi class is providing vegetables. And the Joy class is providing desserts. If you're a part of a different class, uh, just feel free to provide one of the three. Or if you want to bring a meat dish, even though we are providing the meat, we're putting together uh, meat for the, the meal, just, uh, just, just do what you, you would choose to do. And try to have that here around 4.30, 5 o'clock, uh, uh, so that we can have that ready to go. If you can help uh, that evening, uh, please just come around that time frame. I know Miss Donna will greatly appreciate any help uh, uh, in the kitchen. So let's just be good hostesses uh, as we are serving our association this Tuesday. Children's Summer Program will be having regular time Wednesday, but Saturday they'll also have a rehearsal and a little swim party. But next Sunday in the late service, the Children's Summer Program will be giving their presentation. So be praying for them as they wrap up preparation and uh, uh, look to end the summer uh, with this special time. Music committee's meeting next Sunday at 5, deacons meeting next Sunday at 7.30, and youth committee next, sun next Sunday at 7.30. And we are also postponing the trustees and business meeting uh, uh, till Wednesday, the August 12th. So please uh, take note of that. Add to your calendar our revival. Uh, we are scheduled for our meeting September the 13th through the 16th. Uh, we'll have Brother Scott Smith and Dave Stahl back. Uh, we had these two men with us this uh, past year. Uh, uh, last year and uh, just felt impressed to have them to come back. Brother Scott did a wonderful job and uh, so pray for them daily and ask the Lord that he might be merciful and allow us to experience a real genuine revival uh, as a church. So be praying uh, over that matter. Now a couple of things that uh, prayer matters and also information matters. Uh, we received a letter this week on behalf of LaShonda Olds Fitzgerald we have been praying for LaShonda for uh, quite a while. Uh, she has had some real serious health uh, matters, and the community has stepped up on many occasions. But we were asked to just make you aware that at the present time, there is a, an account that is located at People's Bank 
If you would feel so inclined to help the family during this time of need, uh, you can only imagine the health uh, bills, medical bills, other bills that come along with that. And it's been very, uh, very challenging for them. So if you would feel impressed to want to help in any way financially, we just want to put that before you. Also continue to pray uh, for LaShonda and for her family. Uh, another special prayer need has to do with the Meeting the Needs Ministry. About a year ago, the ministry was able to purchase the house that they're presently uh, refurbishing. And when we got into it, uh, they said, well, you'll have to do this and this. And then we got into it, and we had to do about twice uh, what we were told we'd have to do. Recently, they have found there's been some other issues that have come up, dealing with uh, drainage and plumbing and some basement issues. Uh, the, need, the ministry is facing a need of $10,000. And uh, we're asking you to pray. God is able. God provides. You know, as one man said, where God guides, he'll provide. Where God leads, he'll feed. So pray for that ministry. Keep it before the Lord. If you feel led to want to help in any way, uh, we can receive that offering and we'll just funnel it right on to the ministry. So just be in prayer uh, about that. This was kind of an unexpected, uh, unforeseen thing that came up. And there is a goal of opening that place October the 1st. So just pray over that and, and keep that before the Lord. And it's that time of year. We need your input. The nominating committee will be meeting here soon. If you can help them by filling out the little insert of where you feel the Lord was, is leading you to serve and uh, where you have been equipped or feel uh, just a, a drawing to, please help us. Uh, we want to plug you in. Last Sunday in our kind of looking back at our history, we saw that in 1910, they lamented the struggle with getting teachers and workers for the different ministries, and I thought we could write that in the bulletin today, the same words. And so we need your help. Uh, we need you to step up, uh, and the Lord will honor that, the Lord will bless that, and please uh, help us by uh, sharing what the Lord is saying to you as far as ministry opportunity. Well, we're here to worship the Lord, and we need Him, and we need to sense His presence today. And we're going to ask for that. And I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer as we pray for one another, as we pray for these needs, and ask the Lord to just demonstrate his mercy and grace among us today. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we are so overwhelmed with your grace that saved us and the grace that we have experienced that has held us up this week, even though we have faced some adversity and obstacles and struggles in our lives. Lord, I realize that in this church family, there are many, so many burdens, so many needs, so many struggles. Lord, we have loved ones that are going through health crisis that we, we want to fix, but we can't. It's been long, it's been slow, and the progress seemingly is more like two steps back every time we have a step forward. So be with the families right now that are facing health matters, those who have loved ones that are going through health issues and struggles, God bless them. Bless those among our body that are just hurting, can't seem to find a, uh, a good, positive word, Lord, about their health problems. Some here are dealing with burdens on their mind. It could be a financial obligation that has come up, like meeting the needs, this need they have. Lord, it... Um, it may be a family crisis, maybe their struggle within a marriage or parent-child relationship. Or Lord, maybe it's someone here that their job is, is just stressed them out to the point that they don't know where to go. They're ready to just hang it up and quit. Their struggles there. I pray for you to give encouragement today. Lord, just be, be with us. I pray the Holy Spirit will prepare our heart right now, Lord. And help us to receive the word. We pray the word of God to go forth in clarity. and Lord, that it will minister grace today. Minister to us today, Father. Do your work. Do what only you can do. Be with our church family. We pray you'll prepare us to experience genuine heaven-sent revival. Revive us, O oh God. Revive our families. Awaken our community. Awaken our nation, Lord. Be merciful to us, God. We just pray that you'll move mightily in the heart of our, our leaders and 
God, just change hearts. We give this service to you, Lord, and we pray your blessings upon it. Minister grace, Lord, to the hearers. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, one other thing that we want to do before we get into our next uh, song, I'm going to ask Brother Kyle. He is having to oversee the sound this morning. So, Kyle, I'm going to ask you to come on up here. And, uh, Julie, come on up here also with Kyle. Uh, they were have been on vacation. Uh, we're gone last Sunday. But uh, today marks a very special day for this family. Uh, Brother Kyle has been serving First Baptist Church of Owenton for seven years. And that's awesome. You know, the number seven is... Amen. Number seven is, is uh, in the Bible, you know, speaks of fullness. Uh, and uh, so seven years means you, you've just now reached that level of, of experiencing the fullness. So you sure don't want to do anything different now because... Mom, would you want to go back? Uh, less than that. So, so we rejoice in your seven years. Kyle, you and Julie have been exemplary in your faith and in your walk among us and your service. Uh, we just thank God daily for both of you. Uh, we just thank the Lord that he shines through you and the heart you have for others and for people and, and for him. And uh, we thank you for, for being faithful. And we just want to kind of honor you in a small way, a little gift to say we love you and we appreciate you and we just want you to just keep on keeping on uh, for his glory. So God bless you both. Amen. Amen. We're a blessed church. God is good, and we need to count our blessings, and uh, we, are, we are a blessed church uh, to have a young man and uh, family like Kyle and Julie Riddle. All right, well, we're going to sing now, Chuck, you come. Pray for Chuck. That he's been pretty down this week, but he's on the mend, and just pray the Lord will give him grace and, and help. Would you stand with me once again and join me in singing Just a Closer Walk with the... I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I
if you're in the hymnal, flip over to hymn 148. He keeps me singing. There's within my heart. Stand with me once again and join me in singing hymn 350, Shout to the North.
Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. A verse that is probably, your, some of you, you may say, this is my life verse. This is a verse you put to memory. This is a verse that has guided you in many ways. But Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says this, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, when we look at this verse, we recognize the emphasis upon the eagle. Mounting up with wings like eagles. Even the writer of Proverbs was captured by the magnificent flight of the eagle. In Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19, he says, There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four, for which I know not. And the first one he names, the way of an eagle in the air. Now that's interesting. Well, as I began looking and, and uh, reading, I found that somebody has done a little research into the eagle and also has done some research concerning the eagle and the wind and the air. And listen, listen to some of the things they have found out about the eagle in the midst of turbulent wind. Here's what they found. Number one, turbulent winds cause the eagle to fly higher. The tremendous lifting power in the thermal updrafts of turbulent winds causes the eagle to reach heights as he soars with them. Number two, turbulent winds give the eagle a larger view. The higher the eagle flies, the larger will be his perspective of the land below him. I'll never forget when I was pastoring down in the Delta, Mississippi, uh, we're talking flat land, I mean just flat land. When you, what you saw is what was right in front of you. There were no hills, there was nothing ahead, it was all flat. And I thought, you know, there's not a lot of beauty to behold here in this part of the country. I kind of grew up in flat land. But one day, the uh, gentleman in our church who was a crop duster said, Brad, would you like to go up with me? And I said, yeah, I'd like to go up. And so we went up, and we went up, and we got a little higher, got above all that flat land, and I looked down, and I thought, my goodness, that is beautiful. The way the fields were laid out, the way the crops were grow growing, the way the, all the catfish ponds that they had built, how they had built them, the different colorations, I just thought to myself, I never saw the beauty when I was walking on the flat land. But when I got up higher, I saw something that I had not seen before. I tell you, that's the way the eagle is. Turbulent winds, number three, lift the eagle above harassment. At lower elevations, eagles are often harassed by, by crows and disgruntled hawks and so other smaller birds, but the higher that he goes, he is able to leave behind all the distractions. Number four, turbulent winds allow the eagle to use less effort. The wings of the eagle are designed for gliding in the wind, and, and the feather structure prevents stalling, reduces the turbulence, and produces a relatively smooth ride with minimum effort. Number five, Turbulent winds allow the eagle to stay up longer. The eagle uses the wind to soar and glide for long periods of time. In the winds, the eagle first glides in long, shallow circles downward and then spirals upward with a thermal updraft. And then number six, turbulent winds help the eagle to fly faster. Eagles have been noted to fly to, at a speed of about 50 miles an hour. However, when he glides in wind currents, speeds of 80 to 100 miles per hour are not uncommon. Well, folks, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the wind of adversity that often comes against us. I would say right now in this room, there's very few of us that are not facing some type of adversity in our life. And when you look at the word adversity, we know that it can mean several things. It can mean trouble. It's a word that means affliction, opposition, pressure, chastening, anguish, testing, or tribulation. We're all facing it. Many times when I preach a message, I always kind of prepare myself because it seems like oftentimes the Lord will test me in the message before I deliver the message. And sure enough, Friday, I had one of those moments to be tested about adversity. This past week, I received word that my stepdad who had been, has gone through quite a few physical things in the last 
uh, two to three years. T to be honest with you, ever since he retired, he's been going through some real health problems. And we've gone through some heart issues. We've gone through having to be on a feeding tube. And then a year later, he was able to be taken off. His swallowing came back. And then he began having other matters. Well, about six to seven months ago, they found melanoma cancer on the side of his, of his head. Went in, cut it out, thought, good, everything's great. Well, this week, as he's going for just a preliminary checkup, he mentioned that, you know, I'm kind of sore on this side of my neck. I noticed when I swallow. And mom noticed there was a little swelling. And sure enough, they went in, did a PET scan this week, found out that got some cancer again in the lymph nodes, has a tumor there. And August 20th, they'll have to go in and have surgery. And uh, so we got that news. And it was disheartening to them and kind of a struggle. And then I uh, received a call Friday from my daughter who just recently purchased a, a house over in Burlington and said, well, Dad, I've got water problems. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a pretty expert plumber now, and you've heard that story. And I thought, you know, just let old Dad come over, and I'll get it taken care of. Well, I went over there yesterday, and after digging about three or four holes in the ground, it looked like the movie Hose, where they just had holes all over the yard. I realized we need a professional to come deal with this. You're going to have to have the whole water line replaced, and it's getting into the issue that I don't think I'm the professional I thought I was. So anyway, we got that news, and then that afternoon, uh, you know, after all that, Daniel called me and said, well, Dad, you know, I, we're coming home from vacation, and I just thought to myself, I need to probably learn how to change tires on this car. I've never put a spare on this car. And he said, sure enough, an hour later, I had a blowout. And I'm out here on the side of the interstate trying to figure out how to change the tire on a car. And I said, well, it looks like you're going to learn how to do that today, son. So that happened. And, and I thought, well, let's see. Now Paul, if Paul just called me today and gave me some news of something he's done, then that'll just top it all. And I was like, what else could happen? And then Libby informed me that, you know, Brad, don't forget, we're having a yard sale next week. And I'm like, Lord, I can't take anymore. <laughs> that just, that's it. That's the feather that breaks the back. And so adversity comes, you know. We all face it. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know what phone call, the next phone call will mean. But adversity has had its way in many of our lives. And when you think about adversity, adversity can be our greatest motivation for spiritual growth or it can be our deadliest means of discouragement. It really depends on our understanding of God's purposes through it. And that's what we need to look at today because I know you too are facing adversity. I know that you are dealing. Some of you are dealing with health issues. Some of you are dealing with being a caregiver. My poor mom said, Brad, I feel like all I do is take care of people. I'm taking care of your stepdad. I'm taking care of your brother. She said, I, I should have been a nurse. I said, well, Mom, I think you are. You know, you just don't have the degree. You're doing all the work of a nurse. And caregivers get discouraged and heavy-hearted. You may be facing a stressful situation at work or maybe the family's not going quite like you envision or maybe financially, you know, things are just not going so, so well right now. Why, you ask? Why is this going on? As I talked to my stepdad on Tuesday and I, know, I knew he was discouraged and he was down, and he was like, it seems like, you know, this gets fixed and we think, okay, we're, we're good to go and then something else comes up and then we deal with that and we're, okay, we're good to go now some... Something else comes up. And I said, you know, here's what I think we're doing wrong. In life, we seem to have the idea that we'll finally reach some place where the pavement is smooth, that we can walk on smooth pavement. But I said, I believe that that, I don't believe that's reality. And I believe that the reason we get so discouraged is that what we envision or expect and then it meets reality. There's such a difference between the two that that's the level of disappointment that we end up facing. And I said, you know, and I've never called my stepdad dad. His name is Butch, and I've always called him that. And I really, since we've had kids, I call him Pepaw. That's his new name that I call him all the time. And I said, Pepaw, here's what we've got to see. Life is not a smooth road. It's not us walking on smooth pavement. I believe life is, a, is like a hurdler, a guy running the hurdle event in track. If you watch these professionals, when they run, if they really know what they're doing, their feet will hit the ground a couple of times, and then they're going over the next hurdle. And then their feet, they hit the ground a couple of times, and they're going over the next hurdle. And I said, I believe that's closer to identify what life really is like. 
We may have a couple of steps that it's smooth, but be ready, there's a hurdle coming. And you've got to focus on that next obstacle and get over it. And then the Lord has a way of giving you a couple of feet of smooth pavement. But then there's another hurdle. You can't look on to the next hurdle. You have to focus on the one in front of you. You get over that, and then you deal with the next one. You get over that, you deal with the next one. Sometimes God stretches out the pavement. Sometimes you're like the 300-meter hurdler. You get over the hurdle, and you have time to kind of have a few smooth pavements, but you're running, you're giving energy, and then there's always another obstacle coming. You have to be ready. That's more what I would define as life. That's where we are. We have adversity, and we need to recognize that God has a purpose and a plan for the adversities that we face. Now, I want to give you just a few things, and I believe reasons or purposes of why we face adversity. Number one, adversity is God's way of getting our attention. I don't know about you, but I get really caught up with what I'm doing and what I'm going to do and what my plans are. And the cares of, of the world have a tendency to, to kind of take hold of me. And we get busy with our plans, our goals, our projects, our friendships. And then the Lord has to send some adversity into our life to stop us, to cause us to wake up and to get our attention. He did that in the Old Testament. We won't turn there, but in Jeremiah 35, verses 14 through 17, the Lord is speaking to his people, and he said, I have sent my prophets to you. They have shown you the way. They have told you the truth. But the people wouldn't wake up. And so God says to his own people, he says, I will carry out the doom that I have proclaimed. I will carry out uh, the discipline that I had proclaimed would be carried out if you would not wake up. I want to tell you, God has a way of using things to get our attention. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 13, the Bible says, For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. You know what Isaiah is saying? He said, The Lord has sought to use measures and means to awaken his people and get their attention, but they still are not seeking him. I was speaking to someone yesterday concerning a family member that's going through a health matter. And this person said to me, he said, maybe this will wake him up. And I said, it, maybe it will. Sometimes it will, sometimes it doesn't. But sometimes God will send adversity into the life of a follower of Christ to wake us up, to get our attention. We get so tunnel vision, we get so caught up with our own world and our own plans but when we're faced with problems and pressures that are too big for us to resolve, we have a way of, of looking up and saying, Oh God, oh God, help me. You know, we need to be like the psalmist when we face problems. And here's how we respond, Psalm 25. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O my God, I trust in thee. I want to tell you, that's the response we ought to have when adversity comes. God has a purpose. God has a plan. Number two. Adversity is our assurance that God loves us. Isn't that odd? Adversity is God's assurance that He loves you. We've been studying the book of Hebrews and Young at Heart every Wednesday morning. And in Hebrews 12, it's interesting that the writer deals with the matter of God's discipline in our lives. And he describes the fact that one who is disciplined or is chastened of the Lord is proof that he's in the family. He says one who God doesn't chasten or doesn't discipline, he's not a son. He's not in the family of God. And so, folks, when adversity comes, our first response should be, God, thank you that you care enough about me. Thank you that you love me enough that you would discipline me and warn me and guide me and protect me from wandering in a way that would not be good. <laughs> It's a sign that God loves you. It's not a sign that God is mad. It's not a sign that God is, is, is angry. Sometimes it's a sign that God is saying, I love you, and I want to prepare you for greater glory. And the, and, the, and the adversity is coming for the purpose that God is preparing us for something even better. You know, we do that all the time as parents. I don't know how many times I've said to my children during their growing up years, your mom, your mom and I, love you more than any other human being on this earth. We care about you. We want good for you. We, we want the very best for you. 
And there's no one else that cares more about you than us. But there's times that we have to discipline. There's times we have to say no. And we don't do it because, oh boy, we get to. Or, oh man, we just want to be mean-spirited. We do it because we care and we love you and we want the best for you. Well, let me tell you, God the Father is the same way. He wants the best for us. He wants to experience Him in a greater capacity. And adversity has a way of helping us to see that and experience that. My question is, why do we take things so often as a personal attack? Why is it our first response is usually God is mad at me or we get bitter with God? Why is it we do that? I'll tell you one reason. I think we're so pampered. We're such a pampered generation that when adversity comes, we're so quick to give in, to give up, and to quit on the one that loves us so much. So there's a reason for adversity. Number three, adversity is God's call for self-examination. As I was telling you, my, my dad... Stepdad was telling my mother, he said, they're getting ready to go to the doctor. And he said, you know, uh, I've been having a little pain over here and, and, and this and that. And Mom said, when did you know this? <laughs> when, when did this start happening? Why haven't you told me sooner? She said, last week she was concerned about him and we were concerned that maybe he was going through depression and there was something going on. And she said, Brad, I didn't know what was wrong. Something just wasn't right. All this time he knew there was something going on. And she said, you should have told me. So that was a... That was a time that your body was saying something isn't right. And so when they got there, they got to the doctor, they examined, said, yep, this doesn't look good. We need to do this and this and this. And you know, just as in our physical body, it gives off signals, it sends pain to certain areas to say to you, hey, something's not right here. You need to have this checked out. You need to follow. That pain is there for a reason. It's good. It's a, it has a purpose. And let me tell you, God is the same way. Sometimes the Lord will send adversity in our lives that we will pause and examine ourselves. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said to them, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Sometimes adversity is that time that we stop and we search out and we confess and forsake every sin that God shows us. Adversity has a way of causing us to examine and, and to question some, some things. You know, folks, when you're going through a difficulty, let's say you're dealing with sickness. You know one of the questions you ought to ask? Is this sickness due to some sin that, I'm, that I have in my heart? I don't know why we don't do that anymore as Christians. You know, the first thing we do, well, we go take an aspirin, go do this, go to the doctor, set an appointment, do this, do this, do this. We ought to ask some questions about when we're sick. Is this sickness due to some personal sin that I've covered in my heart? You say, where do you get that? Well, Proverbs 28 says this, He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. That's one reason we ought to examine. Some people are sick because of sin. You look at the church at Corinth, people were dying at the Lord's table because they had a, a, a sin in their heart. There was divisions among them. There was, there was hardship and hatred even among the brethren within the church, and they were coming to the table in a flippant manner, and the Bible says some are sick among you, and some have even died. I had an old evangelist that preached a revival for me in Mississippi, J. Harold Smith. He said way back in, I guess this would have been the 40s, 50s or so, that he was pastor at Fort Smith First Baptist Church. And he said, Brad, this church was full of division. It was, it was meanness. There was problems. And he said, I decided we're going to have the Lord's Supper every Sunday for six months. He said, after six months and 40 people dead later, the church was then able to rise up and, be, and, and begin a ministry of reaching hundreds upon hundreds of people for Christ. You see, sometimes sickness is due to sin. Sometimes sickness is due to the fact that we just live in a fallen world because we live in a fallen cult, uh, world. We live in a, a body that's affected by sin. Sometimes sickness is due to satanic devices. Satan uses that. He used it in the life of Job. But then sometimes it's God's call for our self-examination. It's God using it to wake us and say, listen, examine your heart. Make sure that you are where you ought to be with me because I have found that when pressure comes, what's on the inside, when the pressure begins to push in on me, it comes out. Just like taking a toothpaste tube and you squeeze it, toothpaste is going to pop out. And many times when I'm squeezed, I see anger coming out. I see bitterness coming out. I see envy coming out. I see this coming out. And the Lord says, look, 
That's why this is here in your life. You need to see this. You've covered it, and you need to confess it. And so adversity is God's call for me to examine myself and my walk with Him. Number four, adversity is God's way of conquering our pride. You see, grace is free, but there's one essential requirement, and it's humility. Humility. I remember the story of an old preacher dealing with a young preacher, and the young preacher came to the man and said, Oh, preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. He said, Son, what do you want me to pray about? And he said, Preacher, pray for me. I just struggle with pride. I struggle with pride. That old wise preacher looked at that young preacher and said, Son, what do you have to be proud of? <laughs> kind of put him in his spot, didn't he? <laughs> what do I have to be proud of? You know, I'm just a worm. <laughs> Everything I have, God gave me. Everything that God, that, that's done is, is God. It's not me. What do I have to be proud of? I tell you, adversity has a way of conquering our pride. And it leads us to a place of humility. I tell you, folks, I have seen people that were in perfect physical state one day on their back in a hospital bed the next. I have seen people that were financially on top of the world one day and then in a crisis situation the next. I have seen situations where they have changed just in a moment's time. And sometimes adversity comes to conquer the pride that has prevailed in the heart of that individual. And God uses that to bring us to that place of humbling ourselves and recognizing that the Scripture says God resisteth the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Maybe the winds of adversity are blowing in our lives at times that He might conquer the pride that we have allowed to develop within us because we recognize any good that I've done and any good thing that I have comes from the almighty, wonderful hand of God. My ability to think, my ability to work, my ability to talk, my ability to, to make money, my ability to, to, to do things for others comes from God. And maybe that adversity is to conquer that pride that has developed. Number five, adversity is our motivation to cry out to God. I tell you, adversity has a way of bringing us to the place where we cry out and say, Oh God, we need you. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 34. And verse 17, listen to this promise or this passage that describes that very thing. Verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and he delivers them out of all their troubles. Sometimes God just wants us to get with him. And adversity comes and we just have to get on our knees and say, God, I need you. God, help me. God, I need your provision. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need you to do something in my life, in the life of my loved one, that only you can do. Adversity makes us stop and talk to the maker and to the master. So adversity is good. Number six, adversity is evidence of spiritual warfare. You know, we need to recognize, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is pursuing. The devil is real. Sometimes I think in America we just kind of have the, the idea that, you know, we're, we're in America. We don't deal with spiritual things. We don't deal with demonic matters. We don't deal with these kind of warfares. And folks, we have been so lulled to sleep that the devil's cunning device is elementary in nature. I mean, he has to do things on a much higher level in some countries than I think he has to do in America anymore because we've just become so brain dead that we don't think anymore. I mean, it doesn't take much for the devil to overcome. But we need to recognize sometimes that adversity is evidence of a spiritual battle, a spiritual war that we're in. We need to wake up and see that what we see is temporal, but there is an eternal, there is something that is more prevalent, more real than what we can see with our eyes and feel with our hands. There's a spiritual world, there's a spiritual warfare that is going on in the world and in our nation and in our communities, and we need to recognize that. We need to wake up to that, and adversity has a way of reminding us of that. Number seven, adversity is God's method of purifying our faith. In 1 Peter, and Peter talks a lot about tribulation and persecution and the struggles in the Christian life, but in 1 Peter chapter 1, listen to what he writes that I think ties in uh, perfectly with, with this very thing. 1 Peter chapter 1, 
and verse 6 and 7. Listen to these words. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved with my various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, that shows me that God is for my good and he's for his glory. And adversity has a way of purifying my faith. You see, adversity exposes the futility of believing in anything or anyone other than Jesus. It brings us to that point. And for that, it is good. Number eight, adversity is our signal to reevaluate our priorities in life. In, in the Old Testament, in Second Chronicles 26, it tells us about a king, a king named Uzziah. Uzziah served 52 years as a king. And he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord for most of his, his reign. In 2 Chronicles 26, 5, listen to what it says about him. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now, now folks, when our priorities are right and we're seeking the Lord, God has a way of honoring that. And, and we experience God's protection in the middle of our challenges, in the middle of our difficulties. But when you read on in that chapter, verse 16, Uzziah did something very foolish. He decided he was going to go into the holy place and offer incense upon the altar. And those priests, the Bible says 80 of them, valiant men came and came against him and said, no, no, this is not your place to do this. Well, he got mad. He said, who do you think I, you are? I'm the king. I can do whatever I want to. And about that time, when that anger began to come up, he began to have leprous skin come over his forehead and upon his hands. And he, from that point on, had to be, had to be put aside in a, in a house. He could no longer fellowship and worship the Lord as he once did. And the Bible says that what had happened is, in verse 16, he became strong in his heart. You know what that means? He became strong in himself. He quit seeking the Lord. He quit acknowledging the Lord who had made him to prosper and failure ensued. Now, folks, adversity helps us to reevaluate our own priorities. What is most important in your life? What is the thing you give the most time to? What do you go to first? What's the first thing you do? If, if it's anything other than seeking the Lord, you're destined to failure. And adversity has a way of guarding us and protecting us and bringing us back to the place that we make God the priority of our life. And then number, number nine, adversity is our preparation to comfort others. A verse of Scripture, and I, I want to read this, and I realize we're, we're about to, to run out of time. Second Corinthians chapter 1. I read this oftentimes at a funeral service because the hope is that it brings comfort. But listen to these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know what that's teaching me? Sometimes the adversity that I go through is not so much for me, but it's for you. Folks, sometimes it's about others. Now, this verse of Scripture is saying that when we go through a tribulation or a trial, God comforts us. We experience His comfort. And what is the purpose? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. That means that when you've walked through the valley, when you've gone through adversity and you've experienced the comfort of God, you're able to go to that brother or sister or that friend or family member and they're going through some trial. You're able to come alongside and say, let me tell you something, brother. I've been through some heartaches and I've been through some valleys and God's grace has always been sufficient. God's comfort was there for me and it'll be there for you. That doesn't mean you have to go through the same valley they went through to be able to comfort them because it says here we are able to comfort them who are in any trouble because we've experienced the presence of God in the midst of adversity. So maybe the adversity you're going through is for others. There's been times, folks, that I have gone to a home or sat down in front of somebody 
and they are, their heart is broken, and they're going through a trial, and they've just gone through some, some problem. I mean, I remember the first time I went to a young family, and uh, they were so excited that they'd had a little baby, and while they're in the hospital, something happened, something went wrong, and that little, sweet, precious baby died. And I tried to go and say, what am I going to say to them? I've never experienced something like this. I can't understand what they're feeling right now. The excitement and joy that they were having one day and now today they're dealing with the matter of, of death. And all I could do was go to them and say, God, I know you comforted me in times when there's been some valleys, when there were some heartaches and when there were some questions and you were there to comfort me. And all I knew, know to do is to go to them and just remind them the same God will be there for them that you comforted me and I, I somehow be able to comfort them with that same comfort. You know what? Oftentimes, God had just done something so remarkable by just being present and offering that grace and comfort. Sometimes I deal with people and they'll say, Why, Brad? Why? 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 Why did this have to happen? Why am I going through this? And I'll say, I don't know. I'm asking God too. God, why are you doing this to them? And it's amazing that a few months later or maybe a year later, I'll get a call from a family or a family here of a family that have just faced an adversity or a problem. And the first thing I think of is that family that, were, that was asking why six months or a year ago. And the first call I make is to them and say, I want to make you aware of something. Because I believe you may be the one that can step in right now and be a great, great source of encouragement to this family. Because you've been there. And God has saw you through. And maybe part of that, part of it, God is turning it and using it for His glory that you're now going to be able to minister and help this family that's going through the similar thing. Sometimes that's the reason. Then last of all, folks, adversity is God's call that we get to identify with Jesus. Let me tell you something. I'm so glad that I could receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm so glad that when I realized I was a sinner and that he was a Savior and, the, and I said yes and he said yes and it all happened and I got saved and it was just like God cleansed me on the inside and washed me good, I thought, Lord, this is wonderful. I'm so glad to be identified with Jesus. Then I read some verses. Romans 6, 5 says, We also are united in the likeness of the death. I like being united in the likeness of his glory and life, the death. Philippians, Paul wrote, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. That comes with it. Philippians 3.10, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You know what the Bible says? Brad, you not only have the privilege to believe on him and identify in his glory, but you also have been are identified with him in his death. And that means adversity is part of the package. You want to identify with Jesus? Then when adversity comes, don't be so quick to get mad, angry, and bitter. But say, God, I am not worthy to be identified with the Savior, the Son of God but you are allowing it. And instead of seeing adversity as bad, just say, I'm thankful that I have the privilege of being able to suffer in some small measure with my Savior. That's the purpose of adversity. God hasn't forgotten you. God has not failed you. God has a purpose and God has a plan and adversity can be used for our good and for his glory. You know, when we talked about the eagle, someone wrote the law that can cause the eagle to fall is the law of gravity. The law that can cause the Christian to fall is the law of sin. But the power that overcomes the law of gravity in the eagle's life is this. He stretches out his wings, the force of the air over the wings lifts it up, and the power of flight becomes stronger than the power of gravity. Now, how does the Christian overcome? Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. How do I overcome the law of sin? I reach out by faith and I appropriate the victory of Christ that he has won. 
And it allows me to overcome the law of sin. And to be able to recognize that adversity is not a bad thing. It is something that allows me to practice and experience the law of life that's found in Christ. Now this morning, I know some of you are here, that you're facing adversity, obstacles, pressure, burdens. In your life, life of a close family member, a friend, you've been through the valley, you're hurting, let me encourage you to see God has not forsaken you. God has not forgotten your family. God is working together for good. Now, work with Him. Surrender to Him. Yield yourself completely. As a Christian, God is going to do something mighty through that adversity if you will allow it. Man, we could have shared so I've passed over things due to time that we could have looked at, but there's so many more. We just barely touched it. And then let me say to you, if you're here and you're not saved, Here's what I want to say to you. I invite you to join the family of God. I invite you to come to Jesus. I invite you to come and say, I, I want to be saved. I, I want you to come and say, I, I know I'm a sinner. I want to repent. I want to be saved. But I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. You come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And you will not face an easy life. You will not face a bed of roses. You will not face that everything's going to be resolved. All your problems are going to go away. All your difficulties are going to disappear. Let me tell you, if you come to Jesus, you're going to add another one to him. You're going to have a devil that's against you. You're going to have a devil that wants to defeat you. You're going to be not in a... Uh, this, this isn't a playground you're joining. This is a battleground. This is warfare. We mean business. But if you want a life experience that will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you and give you purpose and meaning in life and realize there is a God that loves you and can take adverse situation and adversity and can work it together for good. If you want to know that God, if you want your life to have purpose and meaning, come to Jesus today and take on the title of a follower of Christ even though it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you. It's going to be difficult at times. It's going to be hard to stand. I invite you to come.